Okay, welcome to another question and answer. Oh, it's really busy in the shop today. It's just like exploded with work. And not only that, we, we were filming an online class today. And actually, Jimmy is still here. So he's going to, um, we're just going to work over to him in a minute to see, just to give you a little bit of a preview on what he's doing for his uh, semester. But uh, I did want to talk to you a little bit about the blog. We've had great success. People have been subscribing to the blog just recently posted. Favorite one is the Napoleon chair, uh, but they're all good. Uh, you want to read the stories and let us know how you feel. Uh, of course, subscribing is always the best way to show us that, that you like things. And that goes for the, the YouTube channel, too. So all these are interwined, please. Um, it's really important that your feedback's important, and it, it just keeps us really fed and keeps us going. Um, so I just wanted to give you a little preview, too, on the chair that came in the shop. This is an oak uh, beautiful rocking chair, antique rocking chair, and I've already given a price on it, and I think I want on live try to take this apart, at least the seat part apart, to see what I got myself into, because I'm a little worried about how the seat is constructed and what type of damage there is on that, so um, I'll be we'll, we'll, we'll switch to that now, but right now, I just want to show you, uh, with, just give you a preview on Jimmy's chair. Jimmy's still working, doing a little homework on this in between bullets. classes. <laughs> Jimmy, what do you think of the, the project that you were working on today? I see the corral. Uh, <clears throat> I was going to turn this for people to see. Okay. Jimmy actually did his own woodworking on this. Uh, during one of the one of the week off, he had to take it home and, and do a little staining. And this, uh, this arm was a little loose. And in this class, Jimmy is uh, mitering. It's a very difficult job to do. He's mitering some muslin, a mitered uh, seat uh, onto the onto the chair, in order to repad it. And um, we're gonna we're gonna do that in his next class. So, so um, that's what Jimmy's doing. And Jimmy, uh, how you how you liking the uh, online classes? I like them. I, I get a little pointers every time I go get on, and I just kind of like, okay, I've got to remember it for next time. Maybe I'll be using it for the next project. Great. So no, good. Um, how did the ottoman, how did uh, people like the ottoman? They you? love it because it matched, it matched the chair that I did previously. Great. So, great. I, and actually I was shocked. I found the, the material and it was about a two or three year period between the gap. That's very lucky. Yeah, very lucky. <laughs> very, uh, very unusual, I've been told. Well, I'm glad people like it. Yes, yes. So. They think it's really worth something. That's great. <clears throat> so before I start, um, I want to talk, by the way, please ask questions. That's what I'm here for. Uh, especially if you've been watching the, the current um, semester that's up, or even old segments. Any question that you have upholstery related would be fine. That includes pricing and how to estimate yardage, uh, things like that. Um, how to maybe run a business uh, with upholstery as, as the business, uh, things like that. How to deal with customers, uh, how to interact with customers. Do you offer free pickup and delivery? Things like that are fine. <clears throat> and also these questions. I have a couple of comments, uh, questions um, that I'm going to read to you to catch up on first. So it's been very busy. So I got to take a deep breath. <sighs> yeah, it's been it's been one of those days. <laughs> but now it's the first time today that I sat down. So this is good. So Janine, and thank you, Janine, for being a good supporter of Broadway Upholstery School. Um, please, uh, anybody watching live, uh, don't hesitate to go to the website, broadwayupholsteryschool.com and take a look at what we're doing with the online classes. If you want to get an idea of what my shop looks like, Upholstery on Broadway, uh, go to that. You can go to that uh, website too. So let's get to Janine's question. She says, or she asks a question about the style of dining room chair in the, in, in the video, the last week's video. Can you change the style from just a webbing base to webbing with springs? And she says, she goes on to say, I know it may increase the height of the crown and changes the position of the webbing on the frame, but, and that's, and that's, but uh, that's all I see here. But anyhow, so my opinion on dining room chairs is they shouldn't have any springs. And, and I don't say that about all furniture, just dining room chairs. I'll tell you why. Dining room chair should be firm. You should be sitting up. You should be into the table. They're made specifically to be firm. And every time, every dining room chair that I've seen or sat in that has either coil springs or zigzag springs are the worst, um, you, you sink in too much. So it, it doesn't have the, it's not the proper seating in my opinion. However, if, 
Some people have taken antique um, dining chairs and turned them into side chairs. That's a different story. So um, on the antique chairs, um, or even on the dining room chairs that don't have springs, they give you a, a wide enough stock so that you're able to do spring work. Spring work does require a hefty frame in order to take the springs. So if you're changing from a dining room chair to a side chair for your client, you can suggest coil springs. I would suggest number one springs, the smallest spring. You can still do the eight-way tie, and you've seen my videos uh, showing you how to do that. And I think it would be a great selling point if you're, if you're an upholsterer out there, you're just starting, and you want, it, you want to do that as a selling point. That's fine. It would be more money, obviously, to do an eight-way hand-tied coil spring and change a dining room chair like that. It's a very good question. Um, it's all about seating, right, everybody? It's all about, it's all about the piece of furniture. To, it's what, what do you want the piece of furniture to do? In the case of a dining room chair, you're going to be dining, so you don't want to be sinking. You want to be slouching. You want to be sitting straight up, and you want, you want it to be firm. Um, if you're doing a, a, a club chair, um, you have eight-way tie coil springs and a big cushion and, and a back cushion. You want, you want maybe on the, on, the, on the cushion to be a foam. You can do a foam cushion, but on the back, I usually suggest on a back cushion, like 50% down, 50% feather mix. That seems to be the, the it optimizes the seating in that. So you're always looking, it's, it's all about comfort. It's all about comfort. So good questions, Janine. Keep them coming. And if anybody live has any questions live, please don't hesitate. Uh, I know we were a little late on advertising this, so if we don't get many questions, we're going to know why. But we hope that uh, you're out there right now live. Um, so another question. <coughs> Um, I think this was like last week's, but I think it's worth repeating. And um, Janine also, she says in Australia uh, they can't get the, uh, they can only get the poly edge and not the not the juice. So uh, she's asked. She asked last week was a great question. She can make her own with the, and we showed last week. I think it's worth repeating. I think. Um, in the old days, we made our own everything, and the upholstery shop was well equipped to make our own edge roll. Uh, we didn't make our own springs, that's one thing, but springs in the early days weren't even, weren't even around. It was webbing, you know, it was jute webbing. But um, that was a good, um, you should look at last week's class to actually see me make a piece in that class on, on, on that chair. Oh, so Janine has a, I, I think this is a comment, and I think this is a great comment. Uh, she says, uh, uh, love that creative use of a settee as a bedhead. Actually, it's still here, and I've actually taken it apart. I, I've begun the process of taking it apart. That's the front panel, which is screwed from the back, which you have to remove the outside arm to get to the screws to remove the panel. But we're going to be upholstering that uh, soon. And she says... Uh, she says she can't help but feel a little sad that it's not still a settee, uh, but it's at least better than going to the landfill. So I think that's great. Um, it, this is a piece of furniture. Let's say it's in your living room. It's, it's been in your living room for 50 years. It's a big, heavy settee. You don't know what to do with it. it you, don't want to, you, you don't want to throw it away. You don't, have the money to, to, you don't want to put the money into it to have it upholstered. Why not take the seat out and make it into a headboard. It's probably a, an area of the house where you have room. This, this piece, once the seat was removed, it, it fit nicely in the back of a bed. So that's interesting and a good use, uh, reuse of furniture. I love it. I love it. Um, this one's from Janine. And I really love the fact that Janine's asking a lot of questions. That's great. Janine says, um, she says, yes, please, more stories of true adventures in upholstery like the seagoing sofa. She loves them. Now I'll ask Janine if she can respond to this. We were talking today about, uh, nobody believes me when I say this, it's in, your, it's in your country where they have extreme ironing, is that true? Where they jump out of an airplane with a parachute, an iron board, an iron, and a shirt. And, and uh, you know, I don't know how many jump out of the plane at once with all these items. But whoever has the, the best pressed shirt when they land is the winner or the gold medalist. So, Janine, would you please look into that for us and comment and, and let us know if that's true? Because that, that would really be cool. Uh, we have a question live. Um, let's see. No, this isn't a question, Rise. Let's see. We have teased the kit. Oh, okay. 
wanted to thank people for subscribing to the blog again. Um, and that, Janine, I'm sure that you're one of them, and thank you for that. So that, we have a million stories that we could talk about that's happened in upholstery over the years. Actually, I'll tell one now. Um, I got a call from um, uh, Boston Harbor. Uh, we're here in, Bo we're here in a, a suburb of Boston called Arlington, Massachusetts. And I got, a, can you upholster a sofa on board uh, my yacht? I said, sure, why not? We'll take it out and upholster it. What's the difference? So that was the idea. I go and I estimate it, and um, we order the fabric, and then I go to pick it up. And guess what? I can't. I can't take the sofa out of the. It doesn't fit. It nowhere close to fitting out of the out of the yacht. Well, guess what? They actually build the yacht around the furniture. They actually, you know, have the the, the bottom, the keel, uh, working on, put all the furniture in, and then build the boat around the furniture. How was I to know that? That was so odd. I think we'll make one of these up blogs. So the adventure of that one is she picked a striped fabric. I had to upholster it on board in a, in a, in a very rough, I remember the time it was kind of rough. I was getting seasick. The stripes were going crooked and everything else. That was extreme upholstering, I'll tell you. So we had a lot of fun on that one. So I think we'll add that to a blog. A blog. I don't think Patrick's ever heard that one before. Okay, so... I think I'm ready to start digging into this unless somebody has a quick question online or if Jimmy, Jimmy is a part of our vast audience here at Upholstery on Broadway. Sold out again. Sold out again. Uh, uh, the one ticket sold out. <laughs> Jimmy, do you have any questions about your class and how it's going or Upholstery? Or? No, it's, I mean, it's, it's always changes. I think every, ch every project I, I get, there's always something I'm learning, something that um, I can always, I think, should be reinforced. I should be able to do it two or three times to get a better understanding of it. But, uh, yeah, I mean, it's all this, the chair that I'm doing now was, uh, is definitely something new as far as the cutting and everything like that. So it's all, it's, uh, hopefully it's going to be done in about two or three weeks and we'll see where it goes from there. Yeah, it is and, new. And do you, would you say that every class that you've taken so far, you've learned new things? Oh, um, every time. I've had... Yeah. Wingback chairs. I've had the regular. This is a new, a new one style. I can't even think of the name of the style. I've done two ottomans here already. Yeah. Um, and then there was uh, two or three other chairs, different style chairs that I can't even remember the, what the names of them were. So in, a, in an average week of an upholstery shop, you probably have a variety, probably like twelve to twenty different uh, varieties <coughs> of upholstery. So what, what you need to do to up your, you know, if you're out there and you're, you're trying to learn and, and maybe build a business, it's just repetitive. You just have to keep at it, keep working. It's, it's, it's probably the hardest part about learning any trade, especially upholstery, is the long learning, is, is the learning curve, you know, yes. that journeyman period where you're practicing, practicing. Well, right? you don't see it. In the bad classes, remember, you, you know, yeah. someone will bring in a chair like this, I'll bring in my chair, mm -hmm. current project. Someone else will bring in a simple dining room chair, so it's all varied. There's all so much information all at once. Yeah. How to cut, how to, what to do, the springs. We only have webbing. We're going to use this instead. Mm -hmm. So it's all. So it brings up another thing. Um, because of space limitations here, we, we can't have more than one person that we're teaching online at any time. In the future, we may, on the online classes, have maybe up to 10 people. Um, who are all different. They all have different projects, like you said. They're all at different stages of, of uh, learning. Some are just right from beginners, mm -hmm. first day they've ever picked up a hammer. And some are like you, who have been doing it for a while, maybe. And um, what's interesting about that class would be the camera work. So um, I think the camera work is going to be tough to do that. Well, you need at least one or two, at least two people to start. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Cutting, cutting back, filming, cutting back. And that may be coming sooner than later. Um, we, yeah. we have a space uh, that we're looking at that we're, we're running a class in January. We're going to see how it goes, folks. It's in, it's in Lexington, Massachusetts. It's, it's the Lexington Arts and Crafts. Fine and town. They're in, yes, it's a very historic town. It's, a, it's the tack hammer heard around the world, right, Jimmy? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. That's what I heard. That's right. <laughs> That's why I'm in Arlington. I'm a leap, just leap right into Lexington, and I'm there. But they do have the claim to fame, don't they? Lexington is being the first 
the first shot. Is that true? That, that's what I was told in the history book. Yes. I, I want to believe that. That's the, but the neighboring town there Coffee. that begins with the C, they, they sometimes question that, do they, Jimmy? Oh, you know, they just, you know, historic jealousy. That's what, it is. That's, that's what I kind of phrase it to be. It's always, uh, it's always nice to be the first one, but let's get it accurate. It yeah. should be as accurate as possible. Yeah, actually, it's funny, uh, I think I mentioned last week, but I like to look at history and, and the history of upholstery and things like that. And I was, I was mentioning last week, I think it's worth mentioning again, that I was reading a, an account, a historical account of George Washington visiting Boston. Mm -hmm. And uh, what did they do? What did the mayor of Boston, let's see, what would, the, what would the mayor of Boston present to George Washington? Um, uh, what did he did was he assembled all the tradespeople. Okay. And uh, the carpenters, the mill workers, the the, the barrel makers, the the, the the blacksmiths, and guess and guess who else? Oh. The upholsterer. Oh. And they all presented. The rule is that you you had to present whatever you did in your hands to the president. You you couldn't bring in a wagon full of you know uh, work. It was just one project that you devoted yourself to showing the president, and they displayed their wares. Maybe we should bring that back. You know. I think that would be wonderful. But I think that's worth mentioning again. By the way, any questions you guys have out there, please feel free. Patrick, do we have any questions Not yet? yet? Not yet. Um, by the way, we just posted on the website. Uh, we're gonna, is it posted now, the yearly subscriptions? That's Patrick? gonna be coming out once our next semester comes out. Our next semester is gonna be an exciting one. We're gonna be adding more to the website uh, to increase your, your knowledge base, to make you a better upholsterer. You should check it out. The shop is uh, days away from being live. Just wanted to mention that. And I'm really, again, excited about the kit that I'm gonna be presenting. We've getting a lot of questions about supplies. And um, what I have the answer to your supply problem. Some people like Janine couldn't get a certain, uh, you know, the edge roll. And somebody else asking about, um, she wanted to know if, about the rubberized horse. Thank you, Jimmy. No problem. Um, so what we're going to do is present, we're going to be offering this video with a book on um, upholstery A to Z. It's the fundamentals of upholstery. But I'm going to give you instructions on how to order the supplies for the kit and also how to order the frame. So what that, that will do is introduce you to the suppliers. So what we're finding is a lot of you guys, YouTube people, are calling these people up without really knowing the lingo. And it, it really is difficult lingo. It's like learning a language. And I've been presenting my index of supplies. And I think I'm going to go back to that right now. I'm going to go back to that and look to see where I left off last week. Um, but there's many different ways of ordering and, and um, questions. They, supplies, I'm going to tell you right now, don't like to answer questions. They just want you to order it and that would be done. What the kit will do, if you order the kit, You'll get the supplies that go with the kit. It's going to be a little bit extra supplies, so you'll have you'll have that. Um, I, I guarantee they won't go to waste. And then you you develop this relationship, and that that's what you need to do. Um, but I wanted to continue on on my supply list, and I think I I left off um, last week with um, let's see with pins. I was talking about pins, so. Uh, we're going to go down to ply grip. Um, so a ply grip is what we use when we don't want a hand stitch. And a professional upholster really needs to use it to speed themselves up because they, they can't hand stitch all their outsides. I'm looking for a piece of this ply grip now to show you. Here it is. So this is a piece of ply grip. By the way, the ply grip is what you want. The ply grip is the one that folds easy. It's the, they also have something else. See, this is a good example. They also have something else called curve ease. And believe it or not, it doesn't curve very easily. It's the ply grip is the original. It's a two prong. If you really want to know, it's two prong. The other, the other stuff, the curve ease is three prong. So th this is a good example of how you can get kind of messed up when you're ordering. Um, this is the better one because it has a, you got to be careful with this stuff because you can cut yourself. But what you do is you, basically the fabric goes in inside, let's say the book is the fabric, it goes inside and then you, you close it up like so with your thumb after it's been secured with staples. And the prongs catch the fabric and then you hammer it down with the mallet. 
Um, that's, that's how you close up outsides in a very easy way. Uh, time, it's very time consuming to hand stitch. The only time I'll hand stitch myself is if somebody wants to pay me to hand stitch. And that's usually a little bit more. So, um, any questions so far, Patrick? Yeah. Okay, so I'm just going to make sure I caught up to all your questions from last week before I move on. Um, so here's one more question from um, last week's class, I think. How can I tell if the springs in a chair are good or reused or need to be replaced? Thank you from Australia. Um, I very rarely have to replace coil springs. Coil springs, um, they seem to um, take the energy better, this type of energy this way, so that unless they're rusted, if you see rusted springs, I would say that's, a, that's an indication you've got to change them. But most of the springs that I see that aren't rusted, that are even old, they still have they still have everything they need. Some people oil them, put a little oil on them, um, but um, very rarely do you have to replace a spring. If you do replace a spring, make sure it's the same size. So I think in other videos I've shown you that the way they number springs are from one to five, and and the way they do this is. It's actually six rungs is a number one. So it's anything over five rungs is the number spring that it is. I don't know why they just don't call it a number six spring. But another, another uh, issue about when you're ordering things, if you call and say, I want a number six spring, <clears throat> I don't think there is, you're going to get, you're going to get a <laughs> spring this big. <laughs> so if you're ordering the smaller springs, like on that dining room chair that we were just talking about, you want, you want a number one spring. It goes up from number one to five, I think. Five is for sofas, like it's this big. So uh, that's a good, a good uh, thing to know. Um, zigzag springs though. The zigzag springs take a lot more abuse and oftentimes I, they do break. They break and they pull away from the clip. They're a real problem the way they're put on. They're really not that great um, in my opinion. Um, we have a question here, Dad. Um, Somebody named James, I don't know who that is. Uh-huh. If you were starting in the if you were starting in the business, how much of a cotton muslin would you start with? What special equipment would you need? You know, again, um, the what the kit what the kit consists of is a basic starter kit. You're getting uh, let me just let me just see. On the kit, you're getting a spool of nylon tufting twine. You're getting two size taxes, a six and a fourteen. You're getting a pound of ruby twine. You're getting the French nails. You're getting the cardboard tack tape. You're getting one yard of burlap, one yard of celestra, which is a cambric. You're getting uh, a 1.5 yards of bonded dacron. You're getting five number one springs. You're getting the jute edge roll, 10 feet. You're getting a sheet, half sheet of foam. And you're getting the one yard of rubberized horsehair. And you're getting six yards of jute webbing. So that's a good start up right there. And as far as tools and equipment, I mean, you do need a sewing machine. I, I suggest a Juki. Um, the 5550N five, 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 is what I would suggest. Um, that model may not be available, but the Juki that resembles this the most, which I don't know the, the code name to it, is designed um, for students. And um, it's, it's designed to be an easy machine. And the thing about the Juki machines, the Juki machines are self-oiling machines or internal oiling machines. That means that like on the Singer, you're not, you're not oiling all over the place and endangering the fabric that you're using, especially a white fabric, for instance. So um, always uh, be aware. Always get the, the, the internal uh, oiling machines, I think, today. I mean, the, the Singers were great for 100 years. And um, I think what they did on this, uh, the company did, they reverse engineered the Singer and then they improved on it. And the biggest improvement they did was, the, was that you don't have to oil it from the outside of the machine. So a, a, a basic tools like a good pair of scissors, a, a webbing stretcher, a mallet, you know, side cutters. And you've seen them all when you, you watch the classes, you'll see them all in use. Um, so do we have any more questions on coming in, Patrick? Okay. So we'll go to the next one. Regulators. Regulators are an essential tool for upholstery. 
And a regulator is like a big needle with a handle on it. I can't get one at this point, but that's a tool that we frequently use in upholstery. Now before I go further, and I might get to this next week, I wanted to dig into this rock and check. I'm real curious. I'm sure you are too. I'm really curious as what's inside this. I did want to show you though before I start ripping it apart. Patrick, we might need to adjust this. You're fine. So, um, I actually had to order a scroll of GIMP for this chair because the, uh, we just didn't have the color for this. And I think the color's not bad. When you, you should probably know that on GIMP, when you're ordering, when you're um, trying to match up GIMP to a fabric, uh, expect to be two, three, sometimes even four color shades off. There's nothing you can do about that. Uh, so what you do is clearly make that clear to the customer. That, um, but on this, in this case, this chair, it just really called for a flat gimp. If you put a double welt on this, I don't think it would have held out as much. The gimp is flat. The nice thing about gimp is it's flat against there so that it doesn't get the wear. So that's the gimp we have, and this is the fabric. It's pretty close. So I'm going to put this aside for a minute. I don't even know what, if they have coil springs in here or zigzag springs. I, I have no idea. So I'm going to already bring the trash can over. Because it looks like there's hay in this. And I don't reuse hay. The reason we don't reuse hay, hay. is because... <laughs> hey, Jimmy, I think they have coconut fibers in here. Coconut hair? <laughs> Yeah, how about that? More yeah. coconut fiber. <laughs> maybe, maybe they're from the same family. I don't know. They grow out of the chair. So let's just they multiply underneath. I'll take my side cutters. <laughs> and I'm going to take my side cutters and just pull it. Oh my God. Pull it off here first. What I try to do is I try to get as much of the fabric to help me pulling out tacks as I can. And so I'm, I don't think the uh, gimp is going to come off by itself here. Let's just give it a shot. Oh, this is really tough. It's really dried out, which makes it hard to strip. But one of, mainly what I want to do, well, let's see, we got, a, we got a little growing here. Let's see. Let's just cut this here and see if we can pull this wow. off here. Can you see how old it is, Kevin? Uh, not yet. Uh, my guess would be it's 150 years old at oh, this wow. point. But hopefully we get a date in this. That'd be cool. Yeah, a newspaper from way back then. Yeah. That is. And what's the strangest thing I found in a piece of furniture? I'll tell you. Um, I found two Rolex watches and a United Nations gold coin commemorating the first year of operation of the United Nations. So I was doing it for a, a designer, and this is a good ethics um, lesson for all you would-be upholsterers out there. What do you do? You find two Rolex watches, and you find a gold coin. What do you do? Well, what I do is I put it in an I put it in an envelope. I sealed it. I put the time and the date that I found it, and I returned it to the decorator. And you should have seen the expression on her face when she took those two Rolex watches and that gold coin. I and mean, the gold coin must I don't know how many ounces it was, but it was heavy. And um, I didn't even bother looking up to see how much those were going to be, but you know, they, they, I feel as though they weren't mine. They were, they were whoever lost them in the chair. Just recently, we found a, a brand new iPhone inside a chair, brand new, um, and the customer was very happy to get that back. She had been looking for it for months, and it wedged itself inside the chair. So if you see the blog, if you if you read the blog about the Napoleon chair, we were hoping to find some type of historical evidence in there about Napoleon or uh, maybe about how he died or something but it was fun it was fun taking it apart uh, with the anticipation at least you know sometimes it's a the pursuit is more fun than the actual <coughs> finding of something you know so let me continue with this let me just check out this for a second So uh, we know that people are watching us, so if, you, if anybody has any questions, feel free. I probably talk too much and I answer all your questions before you can even answer them, huh? But that's okay. You're psychic, Kevin. Yeah. <laughs> 
I just want to get, I'm, I'm, my intention here is uh, I'm not going to be taking the whole thing apart. I just want to get inside here. I'm not going to be cleaning up this edge, which I have to do later. I just want to try to get into the seat to see what we're in for. That looks like a double spring. What is the frame style of that, Kevin? Actually, Jimmy's asked a good question about this. Um, what this is so far, I think what we, without really revealing too much here, I haven't seen it yet. I think that we have coil springs, and I think this is a hand stitched fox edging, it's called. Fox edging, F O X, that's the old name. So the new name is not fox. When you call up a supply and you ask for fox edging, they're going to say, What? They're going to want to know that how big it is, which is an inch and a half, inch and a half edge roll, jute edge roll. That's the pro proper name when you're ordering. Um, but that's what that is. That's the biggest edge roll that you can get that's manufactured. Um, and so what that is, but this roll here was handmade. I can tell. They handmade this. And so all this is hay. So what that means is that has to go bye-bye. And the coconut five is too intermixed to be reused. Jimmy actually, re you know, he, he had the option of either reusing the um, coconut fiber, which we explained to Jimmy. Coconut fiber and horse hair. Actually, Jimmy's coconut fiber is right here. Jimmy, want to throw that coconut fiber over? No, not it. the coconut, the fiber. <laughs> Jimmy, can you imagine that, you know, the upholsters in Hawaii actually have to hand pick these off the coconuts in order to get this? How you know enough that that is a product you can use for a chair? Well, that's interesting, isn't it? The reason it is, because it does resemble horse hair. It looks like horse hair. But it actually, the reason that it's, that it's okay to keep is that as a batting, which this is, it has a great resiliency. It, it, each one of these little fibers is like a little mini spring. And that's what you're looking for in any batting. What doesn't make a great batting is, is bonded Dacron. I'll show you a piece. <clears throat> you know, bonded Dacron makes a great top layer, which Jimmy used in, in his chair over the coconut fiber. But it doesn't make a good base. So never use Dacron as a base. Okay, that's a big problem in the industry. Where batting, they, people don't know what, what the uses of batting are and where to use it. So you always use your heavy, good body batting as the first layer. And then as you progress up, it's the lesser, it's the lesser um, bodied fa uh, fibers. Now the bonded Dacron is an excellent under layer for most fabrics. For most fabrics. So I, I use that. I use cotton. Um, sometimes under the under over this and under the <coughs> under the uh, bonded dacron. So put that over here. So on this case, though, Jimmy, the the, <coughs> the hay was just too wrapped up into the into the uh, coconut fiber, and it's it's What's not usable. That? So okay. hay is not hay is a <coughs> initially hay can be an okay batting, but what happens to hay is it breaks just down. it disintegrates. It breaks down, as you can see. This is almost like a powder. Wow. So that's why it's not good. So um, horse hair and, and coconut fiber are the longest lasting battings that I've seen. Cotton too, but you wouldn't be using cotton in an area like that. So they have got this beautifully, um, this is a beautiful hand stitched edge here. And unfortunately the springs, the springs are gone. So I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna take this apart as careful as I can. And then I'm going to re, I'm going to put it back on after I tie the springs. Um, I'm going to replace all this burlap here um, from here to here. I'm going to put a new piece of burlap over the whole thing, do, do some stitching here. But it's, it's beautifully made, it's beautifully hand stitched, so I want to try to preserve it. So that's cool. So, so this is what, um, they, have the, they have this, uh, all the way around they have the edge roll, the fox edging, all the way around, except they even have it on the back, which is really really interesting. They really did a good job on this. So this cake, they call it a cake, was made off the chair. They made it off the chair and then they, they had the burlap was hanging down like this. They tied their springs and they brought the cake over here and they attached it and then they stitched it a little bit. They attached it. That's how, the, that's how it's done. It's not done on the piece. So it's interesting. So uh, I'll be anxious to do that next week. So. I think what we should do now, let's, does, is there any other questions, Patrick? Nope. How about within the vast studio audience out there? Uh, we see, let's see, how many, it's, it's how Jimmy. Many, 
<laughs> well, I'm amazed. I'm amazed with the. I've seen that before. A long time ago. You see how the the craftsmanship of the of the chair itself. But I'm curious to see how would they put it together once you take it out, once you show the audience, and yeah, and talk about a little bit of history because I'm sure that has a plenty of history to it. Yeah, and very rarely do we see any dates um, inside. There was one time we were taking a chair apart um, on the for a YouTube video, and we did find on the burlap we found some type of an identification about a company and we traced the company out to the Midwest and we called it our cowboy. If you go on the YouTube channel, it's called the cowboy chair, Patrick. The 1800s, yeah. 18 saloon chair or saloon cowboy chair. chair or something like that. Saloon chair or something like that. Or, you know, it was right in the thick of things. Uh, we, we traced that chair right back into the thick of things when when all those gunslingers, Jimmy, you could name a couple, Jimmy, uh, the Billy the Kid. Jesse the now, This is Kansas City. Kansas, we, we, that's where it was. Kansas City. Go on to and check that out on YouTube. Kansas City. And that's where all the gunslingers so were hanging out. you go back right? to that day, you're going you, to see an awful lot of how things developed over time, the cities and the towns. Yeah, and, yeah. This, wow. was, this was a grain sack that was used for the inside of the chair that had the, the company name. And we actually found the man who owned the company with a picture of him uh, oh, wow. up there. And, and Patrick did a good, a good research project on that one. So we like history. We coordinate, we coordinate pieces of furniture to times in history, you know. Mm -hmm. It's kind of exciting that way. So we'll be looking forward to getting in on this. Uh, but Jimmy asked a question about what's inside here. I can tell you what's inside here. First of all, they have the webbing on the bottom, the jute webbing. And then they have the springs anchored to the webbing which um, we, use a, we use a clincher today, or oh, these are hand stitched. And then um, they hand tied with, with jute twine, the springs on the top, eight way tied. And then they put a piece of burlap over that. And then they bring their cake over from where they're making it across the shop or whatever. And they apply the cake and, and um, they stitch it down. And then they put extra, the extra pieces that you saw me take out are over that. Uh, the, the, they had uh, probably about an inch or an inch and a half piece of the hay over this. And then over that they had two or three layers of cotton. So everything in there is natural except for the, except for the coil springs. We have a nice comment. We have a comment? And I saw Jude Wright. Um, so new to upholstery, I just wanted to say hi. I love the historical aspect of reupholstering a piece. It's amazing to think about the person who last touched the insides of a lounge. It's true. It is true. All the upholsters. My, I have a story that I tell my students, and it goes like this: um, There was an upholstery shop down in um, where would it be in, in uh, near Washington D.C. Let's say, and there was a woman in there busy, you know, busy doing the upholstery. Now most of the story is true. Um, she's doing the upholstery. A lot of it was hand work. She's got the treadle machine working because there's no electricity, right? And she's working away. Her husband had just previously died, who was the who was the proprietor of the upholsterer in this shop. And she's working away, and um, and, and all of a sudden uh, she hears the door open, but she's not too busy to look up. So she's she's just a treadling machine away, and she's looking down. And she hears a voice saying, "We need a flag made." And she says, "Yeah, I can make flags. I do it all the time. What do you want?" And he says, "Well, we need a new flag for the new country." That was George Washington. George knocked on the door. And this was Betsy Ross. <clears throat> Betsy Ross took over her husband's upholstery shop who passed away. And Betsy Ross became the most famous upholsterer that it ever was. And the first businesswoman. And the first businesswoman. She was, she was extremely talented, of course. She makes you wonder if she wasn't the power behind the whole shop anyhow before, you know. Yeah. Uh, she she was uh, she was given the task of uh, making our flag, and we're very grateful to her. That's a great history question. Who was the first upholsterer? First, first upholsterer, or famous upholsterer? Yes, you know. Jack the Ripper. Well, uh, <laughs> we don't talk about something. That's a different kind of uh, upholsterer. Who we don't talk like, about. Uh, there was someone else, a celebrity. This, oh, uh, Sean Connery. Sean Connery yes. was an upholsterer. Now I don't know what his story is. But um, he must have had a bad day in upholstery and decided to go off to Hollywood and try his luck there. But there was also he one case. So-so. You know? Yeah. So-so. <laughs> 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 hey, that's a good one, Jimmy. He's a struggling actor, I'd say. Did you hear so-so, S-E-W, S-E-W? Oh, I got it. Oh, sorry. I made, I made an upholstery joke. <laughs> 
Jimmy's funny. Um, but then there's another one we don't like to talk about. The dark side of upholstery, and that would be, guess who? John Dillinger. John Dillinger was an upholsterer. Really? John Dillinger, yeah. He must have been pretty frustrated. He was there. <laughs> <laughs> we don't want you or anybody in the upholstery business to get that frustrated where you think robbing a bank is easier than actually having an upholstery shop. Please well, don't probably do that. probably ran out of needed the money for the fabric. Or something. <laughs> Jimmy's got a lot of good one-liners. <laughs> But I have a question about the chair. Now, how, yeah. Is that a piece of, the way the, the uh, bottom is set up, was that a frequent piece of furniture for that time? I would say this is highly unusual. Really? Uh, uh, for that time, yeah. This is a well-made, well-crafted oak. Um, even though it has a walnut finish, it is oak. And it is heavy. I and can imagine. It, it has lasted because of that. I mean, because it's heavy, well, there's a couple of factors in having furniture, the extended life of furniture. One is how heavy they are. And the factor there is nobody wants to lift it to move it. So usually, especially a sofa that's heavy, we have one at the shop now that weighs a ton. And the point is once, once that's in a spot, it stays in that spot. So that preserves it. And um, you could drop some furniture and it won't break. You drop a piece of new furniture today and it just shatters in a million pieces. This furniture here you drop and it, it's going to be hard to break it, you know, so th this is why these have lasted so long and they're worth doing. Or, re you know, like the case of the thing behind me, the, the settee behind me that they got it, it's, it's worth repurposing a lot of this too, a lot of this furniture, or reupholstering, which is what we do here. Um, so I'm really excited about the industry. I'm excited about all the interest that we have too. Um, and all, we, 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 we're very happy with the way the online classes have started. Uh, we've got really good support. We've, we've got, by the way, we're nearing 7,000 subscribers on, our, on, on the YouTube channel. And we, we value the YouTube channel uh, for, for you know, driving people maybe to the online classes, but the two kind of help one another. So I've said it before, I'll say it again. Please, if you haven't subscribed, please subscribe and have your friends subscribe just and to keep us going. And notifications turned on when you uh, so that you know when we do new videos and we, we and so you know when we're live and you know so that we have these live classes. We're going to get better at, at advertising all this uh, with the with it, but that's a good way of knowing what we're doing uh, here at the here at the shop is by the notifications. So please do that. Another um, question here from Jude again. So okay. what is the advantage to making the cake of the chair off the chair? <coughs> It's more of a traditional way of doing it. I'll be honest, I, I do most of my work on the chair. Um, I very rarely do a cake off the chair. I find, I had a Swedish intern actually one summer and she, she was doing the cakes off the chair. I find it it's, uh, depends on your training, I guess. Uh, some people think it's much easier to do it off the chair. I, I think it's easier to do it on the chair. So if I were doing it, I was, I was doing this on the chair, I would have my springs tied um, and then I would hand stitch my front edge, which would require at least three stitches. It would require one blanket stitch first to go all the way across, and then it would require a, blank, a, a blanket stitch to come across here, and a blanket stitch underneath here, and then probably a third blanket stitch in between my other stitches. So it's really important to get this tight. <clears throat> now somebody who does a cake would say, hey, wait a minute. You do it that way, but when I do my cake, it's all together at that point. So that makes it, that stabilizes it. So um, there, it's just two schools, really. I, I don't think one is more important than the other, or right, or the other one's wrong. Uh, I think it depends on your training. So it's a good question. Keep them coming. I mean, how many minutes do we have left, Patrick, or how, many, how long are we going to go? We've got 45 minutes, and then we got probably like 15 more minutes. Maybe 10 or 15 more minutes, so keep the questions coming. I'm not sure if our studio audience has any more questions, but if, he, if, if, if they don't... I would, I would love to see how this all plays out with regard to the structure of it. Yeah. I mean, if, I, if this was a classroom project, I would love to take it apart to see how this is all going. No, let's, let's continue taking it apart then. Let's, let's, I'm sure people at home are probably wondering about it too. So I'm going to clip some of these stitches. Jimmy, I've got Jimmy's uh, curiosity piece, and so I hope this isn't going to be like Geraldo Safe, where where all the anticipation is there and then nothing is found. 
That was a terrible time with him, wasn't it? Do you have a yeah, pair of scissors over there? I did, I did. I scissors. Yes, I have scissors. <laughs> they were building that up for three months. Al Capone safe. Do you remember that? Yes, and there was nothing but there. What was it? Empty? What was there a Coke can or something in there? I think, yeah, that's all they found. I'm going to take this off. I'm going to clip these stitches. Is, is that a steel? Is that a wired frame? That is a wire edge. Okay. But is it, was that, um, just obviously probably for living room sets and stuff like that, and heavy duty. I'll explain that wire edge. That's actually an important element to this. It keeps, it keeps your front edge really straight. Okay. So I'm going to try to preserve this as much as I can. You so I've got a good question from Guy. Okay. I think it makes a lot of sense what we're doing, we've been doing lately. It says, can you recommend a good reupholstery book? Well, <clears throat> I'll tell you, the books that I've seen, uh, there's not many of them, but I've read some of the books, and they confuse me. It's, it's a very, I, I could tell you, because we wrote a book, and it's The Fundamentals of Upholstery, um, and that will be offered shortly, I tr trust me. It, it's written by me uh, as somebody that's taught in over 20 years, almost 30 years in upholstery, um, I could tell you that trying to describe and trying to explain upholstery from a book is one of the hardest things to do. I wouldn't down anybody that's done it. It's just difficult. I've seen some good books with color photographs, uh, you know, and trust me, my book, it went through at least 15 ed 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 edits. Uh, it's very difficult, and I didn't have color photographs. I had illustrations, but I could tell you it's a very difficult thing to take a three-dimensional thing and put it into pretty much a one-dimensional page and try to explain what it is. Hands-on is definitely the way to go. So that's why the book with the video that we're offering is so important. I mean, I think it brings you as close as you're going to get to an, uh, coming into the studio you know, with me working that you're going to get out there. Books. Um, so I would recommend my own book. I'm sorry, Fundamentals of Upholstery, which you'll be seeing soon. Shameless plug. Shameless plug. <laughs> good question. <laughs> but with the video, though, I I I think the the book by itself, if you're really <laughs> into uh, book reading and and learning from a book, you can do it. But I think most people, the book alone is not enough. I'll be I'll be truthful. And this isn't a you know thousand page book. It's easy to to follow along with uh, the yeah, illustrations. It's, it's covering the basics. And so from there, um, <clears throat> you know, you do the kit, you take it apart, you're gonna learn something about taking it apart, and you do it again, because you got enough supplies to do it again. And you do it again. You take it apart, you do it again. I mean, that's, that's, how, you, that's how you get better in the basics. And then you're able to tackle <clears throat> the, the more difficult projects. I'm excited about it. Uh, finally, I've been working on that book for a long time. 1990. 1990, yeah, if you can believe it. 100 years ago. Yeah, so, put it will aside. you be doing a book tour, Mr. Kennedy? <laughs> uh, I, don't think I'm, I don't think that's going to happen. Can you give a free fabric or something like that? <laughs> free fabric with every book, right. Jimmy's getting me in trouble. <laughs> he wants to bankrupt me. <laughs> oh, no, I just want free fabric for my next project. <laughs> So uh, it might be a household name. You might maybe make it to the view. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So I got that first piece off. So I want to show you what they did here. <clears throat> so they have this stitch to the burlap, which I told you has been ex was extended. It was new. Look at how it's falling apart. And now we get to open this up to see the inside of this. And I'm just gonna, let me open it a little bit more. Guy is a fellow New Englander. Yeah. <laughs> Where are you from, guy? Okay. Wow. <clears throat> so what they have here, they have a they have their coil springs, and then they have a wire edge, which they have hog clips tied here, uh, with the, with the clip that they use. These are clips, and then the machine, uh, the, the tool just clamps it over. <coughs> And then, and then this is put over this, and this is hand stitched on here. The burlap's pulled down, and it's tacked here. There is a lot of work in this, so um, this isn't a job where it's just a reupholstery. This is a restoration. Wow. So, <laughs> did I price it as a restoration? No. <laughs> so I get caught on some pieces like this. So, 
What I never do is call the client and say, um, it wasn't what I thought, it needs more work, so you have to pay me more. I don't do that. <clears throat> so what, what I do is try to, when I see a piece come in the shop, try to price it out accordingly. You know, I'm, I'm the expert. I'm supposed to be able to see, even, even if it's covered, I'm supposed to have a good sense of what's needed and tell the customer at that point. Some pieces just, you know, you just can't, and you know, that's okay. That's part of, that's part of the process. That's part of being in business. So, you know, in business, you want to build relationships <laughs> if you're going to stick around for a little while. And that's what we're trying to do here, not only at the shop in Arlington, but we're trying to build these relationships online. And um, that's why we just started offering the, the, the year-long subscriptions, because we're, we're committed to this. We're going to keep presenting this. We have, we have a plenty of people like Jimmy who will take the class over and over again, and Michelle is the other person currently that's, that's uh, you've seen, if you've signed up this first semester, you've seen Michelle. She's actually, just to give you a preview of another, what Michelle's working on now, <clears throat> she's working on a tub chair, fully upholstered tub chair. As a matter of fact, um, we can show the tub chair. It's kind of tucked away over here. Uh, you really can't see much of it, but Michelle's doing an awesome job on it. It's, it's, it's really a professional grade job that she's doing with good instruction. But she's really, um, really following the instruction good. And Jimmy on his ottoman, I'm very proud of the work that my students do. <clears throat> Jimmy did an excellent job on that. And actually, Jimmy's ottoman was a very difficult um, application because he had a newer style ottoman that not necessarily was made to be reupholstered. So <clears throat> what I mean by that, if you, see, if you buy that, you'll see what I mean. Um, so you have to kind of problem solve some of these pieces. Um, the, the older pieces are good because they're straightforward and they follow traditional methods. Some of the newer furniture, uh, the manufactured furniture, they're just trying to cut corners to get to the same re top result. So therefore it's sometimes harder to do newer furniture than it is the older furniture, believe it or not. So. Now Jimmy, Guy is actually from North Conway. Ah, okay. I, that's a really cool area. Yes. But he left in 1975. He left in 1975. It was a good year. Yeah. <laughs> so North Conway is the, the home of uh, uh, some a famous ski resort, which I can't yeah, remember that's, right that's, now. What is that? I, I look, I, Brenton Woods. That's yes. North Conway? Brenton Woods is in North yes. Conway, I think. Yeah. yeah. I got stuck up I, with Brenton Woods in the middle that, of winter. North Conway is a beautiful vacation I got stuck. Spot. Jimmy, yeah. let me tell you a story, Jimmy. I was up in North Conway on one of those, I think, I want to say 302 up there, one of the old country roads, middle of winter, really snowing, cold, got stuck, and I wasn't going anywhere. And I ended up, I ended up at one of the Brenton Woods Resorts staying overnight there. That was, really? that was quite a, a trip. Oh, there. I thought you were going to say you were going to wait for the spring thaw. Well, I, I don't think I would have made it if I waited that long. <laughs> <laughs> so I think, Patrick, unless there are any other questions, Patrick? Yeah, I feel like when we start these, as soon as we start winding down is when it really picks up. Yeah, that's true. Are there any current questions right now? I just want to warn people, I think we're going to wrap up in a in a minute here. Just one other comment, Lynn from uh, Lynn? Asheville, North Carolina, loves your videos. Oh, thank you, I really appreciate it. Keep those compliments coming. And you know, criticisms too. I mean, if, if people find that the camera angles are wrong or the lighting's wrong, we did fix a lot of that from the old YouTube videos. We, we're learning a lot ourselves. We're not, I'm not Steven Spielberg, and I don't pretend to be. And I, right? and I don't think Jimmy's, uh, he's no Clark Gable, by the way. So, so, you know, if you have, this one up. <laughs> if you have questions about, uh, if you have criticisms too, please, about no. camera angles or, or that I talk too much. Somebody said I talk too much. I think my, my son said, well, just turn the volume down if you don't want to. <laughs> yeah, maybe they want more airtime of me, but who knows. But with students, though, if you, if you see the interaction uh, between students and, and me, um, I think the online classes, and I, I've said it before, <clears throat> please sign up. Because another shameless plug. Another shameless plug, but really, <laughs> I can't, when I'm doing a YouTube video, I'm not... Uh, I do things I'm so mechanical. I think it's true with almost everybody that's a professional that's doing YouTube videos. I think they, a lot of the information is left out. Um, with the classes, Jimmy and Michelle and, and coming up, we're going to maybe have a class of 10 people. They are asking the right questions. They're, 
constantly asking questions. It's like a kindergarten class sometimes, which is fine. That's what it's like. That's where you learn. And I gotta mention this guy mentioned Adatash Mountain, and that could be a story about what happened to you up there. <laughs> a few years ago. Oh boy, yeah. I might even post the video. Maybe, oh maybe boy. Maybe guy knows somebody who can give you some, some survival skills the next time you go up. Well, there. guy, I don't know if he 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 could, yeah. But this you know, is. You a, can kind of give him a, a tips on the upholstery, and you can maybe give. But him you know, Jimmy, I find every time I leave the upholstery shop, I get into trouble. Yeah. And this Adatash Mountain is an example. <laughs> I was up there. I, and, and Adatash Mountain, for all you people who don't know, is probably the most rugged mountain in New England, right? What's his name? What's Guy. White Guy? I mean, that mountain is, is, a, is a horror show. And it's a horror show for a couple of reasons. It's very steep, like most mountains. <laughs> but also, the wind. The wind is amazing there. It, many times, people can't even ski. The wind the wind chill factor is so low up there. But anyhow, one summer, we decided to go Bike, mountain biking, which I thought sounded okay, Jimmy, right? Yeah, it sounds and good. But... Boy, boy, I tell you, I had a spill, and Patrick caught it on video. He of course he did. He's the, he... he's the conscientious <laughs> son. That's what he is. He caught it on video, and boy, I went over the handlebars, and boy, I, I saw my life, my upholstery, every upholstered piece of furniture that I ever did flashed before my eyes. And as I was falling, that, 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 that sofa that I did on Boston Harbor, and that other one that I did, that one that was out in the ocean, that salty one that we just put on the blog, and, and this, all these furniture came, all of them flashed in front of my mind, and then I hit the ground. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that's a great place. Well, I think that should have been a survivor story. <laughs> I think that's an excellent place to stop this question and answer. We got a little silly because we we, we apologize. We did not advertise a lot on this class uh, beforehand, but we know people. We were noticing that people watch these classes. Um, many people are watching them after they're posted, after they're live, and so we appreciate that. And uh, so I think we're going to close it out. Unless uh, just check one more time to see if any questions online that came in. No. Just a lot of funny stuff from Guy. He's saying he's too old for surfing. Because <laughs> he lives in L.A. right now. What? Oh, he's, how did he get from Adatash Mountain to L.A.? <laughs> Boy. He, he, he doesn't like ski country? <laughs> What's wrong with him? <laughs> well, Guy, I hope you're upholstering now. I, I want, I'm going to give you an assignment. Uh, did he say he doesn't surf, Patrick? Or? No. Oh, well. I want you to take up surfing and upholstery. And I want you to try to upholster on the surfboard. And I want you to make sure that... All the fabric that you use for that is scotch guarded. Right? So I guess that's the end of our question and answer, and we'll see you next time.